Hey YouTube, Pete Turner here and I'm back again with another video and as promised in this video I'm going to be reviewing some of the videos that you sent me so that I can look at the mistakes that you guys make in performance to enable all of us, myself included, to take our performances to the next level. Now in the comments of one of the previous videos that I put on this channel somebody said a real pro knows that you can't teach somebody else to perform. They've either got it or they haven't. I agree with one small part of that sentiment. I can't make you a better performer, only you can do that. But I can give you advice on how to change things that surround the performance so that enables you to look at your performance retrospectively and make it more appealing visually for your audience. So yes, it is possible to make somebody a better performer by giving them techniques but you could take a horse to water, you just can't force it to drink. So you have to put the time in to make this work. Now this video, we're initially gonna start with an interactive performance. And then I also shot a performance that I performed on Nathan when we were social distancing. And there's also a section of this video where me and Nathan reviewed some of the videos that you sent because we got sent lots, we got sent hundreds and we're not gonna be able to have time to review all of them. And the video got so big, it were over an hour long that we're breaking it into parts and this is going to be the first part and then you'll get to see a performance in the next part that I've done and then I'll pull that performance to pieces and share with you the little things that I really like about it and again the things that I don't and then the last part is going to be me and Nathan sat reviewing footage. So to start with I'm going to start with a performance by Sage Warden. So Sage Warden sent me in a clip of him performing and he's performing a staple gun roulette. Our four staple guns, one is loaded, three are not. Only I know which one is right now, but I'm gonna have Emma please mix them up while I'm looking this way. You guys make sure I'm not watching how she mixes them up. They can be in any order you want. Just tell me when you're done. So the first thing there is that it's a very small performance space and these are the type of venues that I'm really used to performing in. And the biggest mistake here is one thing. The scripting's great, the performance so far is great, the pace is great. You can hear Sage clearly. Now as a performer, great. I don't think he really needs to change anything about his performance as a whole. But what I do think he needs to change is his understanding of space and the understanding of the spectator mixing the props up. When the spectator is mixing the props there, she's got a back to the audience. So the entire bit of action is completely blocked by the spectator, which is not a good thing, you know? And the reason it's not a good thing is because the audience can't see if she's mixing them. So what I'd have done there is there's a chair or I'd have got a little table, there's a chair there, I'd have put the staple guns in front of her and I'd have said to the entire audience, you're going to be the eyes to make sure that this is entirely fair. As, and then whatever the spectator's name is, is mixing these, I'm gonna keep facing you the entire time or pick somebody in the front row and do something with them as these staple guns are being mixed up, something that's really quick, a quick hit. You know, whether it's a star sign revelation or something that just suggests that you can't be looking at the order of the staple guns as they're being mixed because you're too busy doing something else. And at the same time, if the audience are ever under any illusion that these are not being mixed, well, now they can see the spectator mixing them up. So the first thing is don't body block the action. Imagine a film where all the action were hidden behind somebody's body. It just doesn't play out very well. But again, all of these clips are great clips. All of these are, are things that are really great moments in performance that we can learn from. So the first thing straight away there is make sure your props are in a place that everybody can see the action. If there's a moment of action happening, you want the spectators and the audience to see it all at the same time. Okay, that was quick. You sure? Yeah. All right, now I'm gonna try to influence you. Right now, they're in order like this. It's gonna be one, two, three, and four, okay? So I'm gonna try to influence you, don't let me, but you can pick either one, two, four, or three. Just pick up one of the staple guns and bring it up here. Like you're gonna shoot it, but don't. To stay true to your process there, influence doesn't really work in this scenario unless you say, I've marked one of these staple guns in a very particular way so that I know which one contains the staples and I'm gonna to try to influence you to pick up the guns that don't contain the staples. The problem with that is, is that once you mention that they mark, the whole idea of trauma in the routine and vulnerability of getting it wrong goes out the window. So you really need to think about 
the premise of the routine because at the beginning it made sense that maybe I know where they are and I'm going to try to influence you to pick up the guns that don't contain the staples but then when you mix them you should also not know where they are so I'm going to try to influence you don't let me think about what it is that you're saying to your audience think about the premise and so now the premise in this is that it's roulette and so either one of you's got to know where the bullet were loaded or it's a game of chance so influence doesn't really come into it but what I really do like is the way that you misnumbered you know you misnumbered the staple guns when you said them out loud to make it feel like you're doing something verbally which is really brilliant and that's great and I love that but you can pick either one two four or three just pick up one of the staple guns and bring it up here like you're gonna shoot it but don't that part's key that part is key yes all right now you're gonna take it and put it up to my chest and whenever you're ready just pull the trigger if you sage and your spectator swap sides on the stage the audience would now be able to see the inside of her arm and her face because she's facing the wrong way she's like this she's body blocking the action if she was either using her, her opposite hand or changed the way that she sat we can now see her face so think about that think about the way somebody's going to act and you can quickly know whether somebody's right or left-handed by asking them if they're left-handed they'd stand on the side of the stage that they are now if they're right-handed they stand on the opposite side so that they're open and body blocking plays a big part in either trying to hide something or trying to open something up and you always want to be able to see the spectator's reaction Good, good. Everybody give her a big round of applause. Yeah. 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 This is just a tiny thing and this is just a preference of my own. Instead of saying everybody give her a round of applause, if you set the audience up to applaud at the right time, they'll always applaud for you at that point. So what I mean is this, instead of saying everybody give her a round of applause and have to ask for the round of applause, you sit there and you sort of wince and you say, if Rebecca, or whoever it is, who, if Rebecca pulls this trigger and I don't end up with a staple inside me, go absolutely crazy for her. And now click and then you look up and you go like this and now your audience are going to applaud. And every time from that point when she pulls the trigger, the audience are going to applaud. All right, so now we're down to three, so the odds get a little less in my favor. I want you to pick up either one, three, or two. Just pick up any one you want and bring it up here. Again, I really like you misnumbering those staple guns. I think there's something really nice about that. It's suggestive. And if you want to go back and see somebody else doing this sort of thing, if you go back to uh, The Mind of Burglass, which is also searchable on YouTube, and he does this thing that's calendar chair. It's like a chair test that's a calendar. And he does that. He says the number's out of sequence, so it makes it seem like he's influencing their behavior. And there's a really important performance tip here is that you should always be suggesting that you're doing something. Always give your audience a little bit of thread. And now to go back to the last interactive experiment that I did, you know, I did that in that. I talked about at the end how I'd said a certain th phrase or I'd done this or I'd done that. And of course, that's not how it happened. But I give the audience just a little bit of thread so people pull it enough to be able to be at ease with themselves and accept that something's happened so they don't look for any other method. And that was so brilliant about Darren Brown. Darren did that so well that people never bothered looking for a method. If he does something impossible now, they don't go, oh, wow, that were impossible. They go, oh, that's Darren Brown. You know, they've given credit for being able to do the impossible. Well, that was another one down. Good job. Yeah. This is where it gets that really scary because now we're down to 50 50 shot. Would have Emma, cried. please don't mess this up. You can pick up either one and just bring it up here. So this is where the narrative for me slightly falls flat. You've had this incredible narrative that you've been weaving through the entire performance. But you can pick either one, two, four, or three. Just pick up one of the staple guns. And then when it comes to the biggest and most dangerous choice of all, you don't say anything. You can pick up either one and just bring it up here. Say this is the most important and biggest choice that you're going to make. This is where the odds are totally not in my favour. I want everybody to stamp your feet on the floor. 
whilst you decide upon one of those staple guns. We're gonna give you 20 seconds. I want you to use the entirety of that, 20 seconds is a long time, maybe 10 seconds. I want you to use the entirety of that 10 seconds to make your choice. So now you've got your entire audience going bang, 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 bang. And it's a really big moment. 10 seconds, keep changing, keep changing, keep changing. She picks it up. Do you want to change one more time? Make it a big moment, make that last decision huge because then it really displays the impossibility of the last decision, which is ultimately the biggest of all. You can pick up either one and just bring it up here. <laughs> all right, and this one. <laughs> oh, shit. Bring I'm it. Keep this uh, flat part up to my cheek because there is a hammer that comes out. So I don't want it to lift it in the head. Just kidding. Just kidding. Good job, Emma. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So here for me is where you broke the golden rule. And the golden rule in theatre is to never turn your back on your audience. Unless there's a choreographed motive for turning your back, like in a hypnosis routine or something like that. But it's doubly bad in this moment because this is a moment that you're trying to express the fairity of the experiment that you've just conducted. And I know what you're all thinking. Obviously, none of them are loaded. And at that moment, you're pointing out that the staple gun everybody's believing is empty, but you're the one that retrieved it with your back turned, so how does anybody know that you didn't load it? Sounds ridiculous, but think about it from the perspective of a skeptic that's sat in the audience. You wanna make everything impossible and not even give anybody an inch in terms of the real method. Like I said earlier, give them a piece of thread to pull at but never give them an inch when it comes to the real method. So just make sure your props are in front of you. This took a long time to get into Ryan Trix's head. Your props have got to be reachable at a moment's notice in front of you. And there's a chair there, you know, put the block of wood on the chair if you're insisting on using a block of wood. My recommendation would be don't use a block of wood. The interesting thing about our brains is it tricks us to believe that an inanimate solid object like a block of wood when we put a staple gun into it, a staple into it, makes us believe how solid the gun is and how much damage it could cause. But there's only one person that can see that staple because it's this big. So trade the block for something that visually represents and audiologically represents what you're trying to express. And the way to do that is to change out the block of wood for a balloon. If you change it out for a balloon and put a small amount of talcum powder inside the balloon, when the balloon explodes, you see that mist of talcum powder come out of it and it feels and looks much bigger. Especially if the spectator's holding it, they're turned very slightly toward the audience like this. You bang it, you get her reaction in her face and then the entire audience hear the bang and their brain goes back to the moment you just had it against your head. Now that little tip with the talcum powder, I took that from a stunt video that I watched, one of Jacka Chan's uh, tutorial videos on stunts. And when they kick somebody in the side of the head, they actually pop holes in the foam shoes and sprinkle a little bit of talcum powder inside. So when it makes impact, you see the dust. And that worked the same here. So just think about, you know, choreographing the moment of a revelation and how you can translate. And that's the key word here, I think, is translate. You can translate where it is that you're trying to represent to your audience in the best sense possible. And all of a sudden a block of wood doesn't seem as impressive as a balloon exploding, even though we know a block of wood's more solid than a balloon exploding. So I hope you're following my train of logic there. <laughs> Everything else about the performance, your staging is great, your spacing is great, your scripting is great, your pacing is great, the way that you handle the spectator is great, you're very confident, you look great, everything about the routine, other than those tiny little bits, are great. And by changing those tiny little moments, you've got a masterclass on your hands at how to perform a staple gun roulette. And that's what I'm trying to express here, is the small things that surround the performance. And another thing that I really loved is your handling of the mic, because that is the number one pinnacle downfall of most performers. And the next clip that I'm about to play was sent to me by Nathan. He said that he's asking for this video to be reviewed. It's a friend of ours, Chris Thompson. And I wanna show you just how much of a nosedive the performance can take if you make the mistake of trying to hold the microphone whilst performing if you're not adept at mic technique. 
So let's take a look at that now. So this second video is uploaded by Christopher Thompson. So Chris Thompson is somebody that's part of our social circle. I've known Chris for a number of years. And Chris is a self-proclaimed procrastinator. He's somebody who doesn't want to put the time into practicing. And you'll give him all sorts of pieces of advice and you'll say, have you done this? And he'll say, oh, I've been busy with this or I've been busy with that. And he'd be the first to admit, you know. And this performance is actually filmed at one of my residencies. So I used to have a residency at the VM Bar and Grill, which is in Shipley, and I'd have performers from around the world when they were visiting me or I were consulting, calling, and some of them had opened the stage show. And it wasn't an open mic uh, for musicians. It were mainly for jugglers, fire breathers, magicians, mentalists. And I'd be the host and the compare, and at the end of the evening, I'd do about 20 to 30 minutes every other Sunday. <laughs> So he's searching in his pockets for the prop. A moment ago, during Sage's video, I said, make sure your props are accessible and at hand, because this moment would be slick. He'd be picking it up and he'd be moving on. <laughs> we can't hear him. And the reason that we can't hear him is because the microphone is angled down and it's a one directional microphone. <laughs> And here I am, I'm making a cameo appearance. I actually adjust the microphone because I realize that that's what's the problem and I told him to adjust it beforehand. So whenever I did these type of shows, I always made sure one of two things. There were either a mic stand that were put off to the side, they were already adjusted to the right height for me. Or I had the microphone in my hand so that when I came on, I started to speak instantly and it looked slick. <laughs> He's about to make the mistake. <laughs> oh. Watch. This next 10 seconds is a difficult 10 seconds to watch because he realizes the mistake that he's made and at this point it's almost impossible to fix it especially if you don't know how to use a microphone. The spectator had to take control of the situation. And that's a bad thing when your audience members have to take control of your performance in order to get it off the ground. It's a big lesson. Move the spectator into your performing space. If the spectator is miles away and you're somebody like Nathan who can make jokes during performance, say, I'm not going to bite you or whatever the joke is, ask them to move in. Come a little bit closer for me, we'll stand here. Or move the mic stand. Don't take the mic out of the cradle unless you know what you're doing. So this is a few yeah, I am... Um... You need to really specify and ham up the fact that these are all different. So in that situation, if you want to convey the message to the audience, and again, it's about translation, and we talked about that a moment ago, you want to translate to your audience that something's fair and above board, it's really simple. Ask that person on stage to be the eyes of the audience. Say to them, can you verify for everybody that every single page in this book's different? Each page contains a different Marvel character. And each one of these Marvel characters, if you were to think of a scene from a film, would evoke a different memory inside your head, correct? Yes. So he's put the microphone back on the stand. So he might have just saved himself here. What I want you to do? No. So he hands the spectator the pad and then takes it back. This really, really is a display of how important it is to practice. To practice what you're doing with your props. Oh. 
Oh, listen to, to what the spectator says. The spectator says, do you want me to hold the microphone? The spectator is again bailing him out. Okay. Now, just thinking of the audience are laughing. It's a bad, bad thing. I mean, how's he played this back and not heard that? Yeah, I've got to your mind and just keep this by itself. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. Okay. Somebody just made a yawning noise and the audience laughed. The audience are laughing again. This is a great representation of why it pays to practice. And Chris, if you're watching this, which there's no doubt you are, I don't want anybody thinking for a second that, that this isn't things that I've already told Chris. But practice makes perfect. Rehearse what it is that you're going to do and what you're going to say. Get an idea of the narrative. It doesn't make a difference if the narrative doesn't really make sense. As long as you're saying something that could seem plausible, it's better if it does make sense. But just practice. Practice the use of swiftly moving from one prop to another. Practice the use of, okay, if I need a microphone here, instead of me going to the spectator of a microphone, bring them to me where the microphone is. Take the book off the table. This performance should have run as quickly as this. You take the book off the table. Can you be the eyes of everybody here to verify that there's a load of different characters inside this book? Boom, 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 boom. Yes, is there anybody in the audience that would like to check this book out as well? No, perfect. Each one of these characters, if you were to select one, I'd evoke a different memory or a different scene from a film that you might have watched. Yes, I want you to take this pad, lift it up like this, look at a character and close it. But instead of just thinking of the character, I want you to think of the exact or particular scene that comes to mind when you're thinking of this character. They get one in mind. Start to describe the scene, nail it and you're done. That's it, a minute routine, tops. <laughs> This is again another lesson in translation. Translating what you're doing to your audience. And I know it's a subject that I keep touching upon, but when he's writing this down, he needs to be conveying the things that are coming into his head. And Uri Geller did this so well. He'd do things with his hand. And one of the best representations of this is a guy called George Anderson. And I'll try to find a clip of him doing this. He sits with a pad and he just lets his hand move and it suggests something's happening and he's receiving thoughts. At this point, all I can see is him going to write something and then stopping and then going to write something and then stopping and then going to write something and then stopping. Describe what you're seeing in this scene, you know, say what you want. You could literally say whatever you wanted and say to the spectator, don't say anything, because all this is doing is leading me to the character. Write the character down, who is it, bang, get the hit. And then the character confirms the rest of the things that you've just said. <laughs> yeah, now what, what was the character you were thinking of? Captain Marvel. Yeah, that's it, yeah. That's I'm not here to ridicule anybody. I'm going to close this for a second. I'm not here to ridicule anybody's performance. Chris told me to be brutal because I'm good friends with Chris. And we only learn by growing. And in the video that I did with Nathan, where we look at a few more different videos, I express that the worst position you can be in as a performer is to be part of an echo chamber. And echo chambers, these little communities or groups that are on Facebook or private groups on Instagram and groups like that where everybody pats each other's back. It's great to promote each other's videos and like each other's videos, but the moment that you start to just be a yes man and the moment that you start patting your friends' backs is the moment that they suffer in the long run because they never improve in terms of the performance and the things that surround those performances. And Ryan will tell you I'm the harshest person ever. If he puts something into one of our private groups, I'll say, no, that's shit. 
this is what you could change and then we'll have a session where we all jam it out and we change it. The same when I'm performing something or when I'm looking at a performance, Ryan does the same for me. Our groups are the most brutal groups that exist out there because we're bad with each other, we're nasty to each other, but not nasty in the sense of nastiness, we just say what we mean very quickly and then we fix it together. And as a result, we all grow. So if you're part of one of these echo chambers or private groups, start to be honest with the people because you're not doing them any favors by telling them lies. And Chris is on his way to becoming a better performer because he's taking his time to take on board the advice that we're giving him. But, you know, if I've reviewed any of your videos and that's two of them and I'm gonna look at another one in a second, don't feel like I'm being harsh because I'm not. All I'm doing is doing what I do for myself to get my own performances to the next level. So Chris, if you're watching this, I hope you like that analysis because you know that video, get it off of YouTube, stop uploading stuff like that. Look at your videos and have a consciousness about how bad it looks. Listen to the sound in the background. It's bad and remember one thing, that if that's the public in the audience that are putting across those viewpoints loudly enough to be heard on a recording that you've got and on your phone, then that's also gonna be the opinion of the public that are watching the video. So don't be too lazy to think that I should watch my videos back to review them and critique yourself. So let's move on to the next video. So the next video sent in to me was by Daniel Sutton. Now I do know Daniel, Daniel's a great guy, and he sent it in and he said, take a look at this, this was me practicing in a coffee shop, tell me your thoughts. So I'm gonna tell you all the things that I'd have changed about it and the things that I really liked about it. So let's take a look at that now. Okay, so recently I've been having these, well, let's call them visions, right? But they don't know if they look like it's coming from my eyes, which is this one from so the premise of this is great, you know, I've been having these visions recently and I'm not sure myself if this are visions I'm having through my own eyes or somebody else's, which the premise of that is a really, really nice premise, having visions from somebody else's eyes or seeing things from somebody else's perspective, but not knowing the accuracy of them because you're basically challenging your own intuition. I think that's a great, great concept. There's a film called In Your Eyes. That's a great film to watch if you're interested in stuff like that. <laughs> Take, a, take this gun, hold it close to your chest. And all I'm gonna do is watch. I'm just gonna be clean cut. Happy with this? Yeah. Yeah? Right. So just show, show that to the camera for me. I'm not gonna go into the methods that are being used. I am gonna mention one thing. And anybody who knows the method from watching this little bit will understand what I'm saying. And anybody who doesn't, then it's probably gonna wash straight over your head, but it's worth a listen anyway. Daniel, you'll definitely know the method. The selection process at this point, I feel, wasn't as fair as it could seem. The method that you're using, you don't have to have them cut the cards to arrive at a card. You can literally spread through them and at the point that they want to stop, you tell them to stop, you drop the cards on the table and you say, take one. It seems much fairer. And it also allows you to get the motivation for the bit that you need to know what card it is that they've got. I hope you understand what I'm saying because I'm gonna play back one moment that is a pinnacle moment for performers watching this and I hope you don't mind me putting this moment forwards. It's not an expose because if you don't know what the method is you're not going to know what this is relevant to. Um, but I'll explain a different method to be able to get around or work around that moment. That moment there when you're being filmed is not a good moment because people are always filming things these days. Whether it's a casual performance like this in a, sh a coffee shop or on stage, people have the ability to film you at any moment at all times and play it back. And that moment there could have been easily changed by doing one thing and one thing alone. If you want to seem really casual, imagine that you spread through the cards and said, you just say stop where you want just there, take the card that you stopped at, complete the cut turn the rest of the deck face up and say for everybody else I'm gonna look away whilst I'm doing this and I'm not turning my back I'm looking away there's a big difference because we did talk about body blocking earlier spread the cards face up on the table and say so you could have gone for any one of these cards but you didn't you pick that one square the deck up and turn round now whatever cards there is the card that you need right you're not having to do this thing where you go 
you don't need to do that. So again, one more time, you literally get them to pick the card, you complete the cut so that the cut's completed, they take the card, they look at it, you say to everybody else, you could have picked any one of these and I'm not looking. Are you happy that's a fair choice? Good, square them up, turn back round and pick the deck up and you're done. You've got a natural motivation for that moment. And another thing here is I wouldn't use those playing cards on camera. They're very difficult for an audience to understand. I mean, when I watched this the first time, I thought it was the Four of Spades and I misremembered that it was the Four of Spades because of the colour of the cards. Happy? Yep. Right. Um, so, keep that. Yep. What I'm going to do is quickly put yeah, See how the interlace is going to weird at all? No? So, there's a very important line of scripting that I want to sort of pick apart that you just said. When you were shuffling the cards, you said, notice how nothing weird's happening here, I'm just shuffling. And that sounds like it's fair, but it's not, because what it is is, it's an implication that something weird could be happening. So you need to keep those implications down to a minimum. It's like saying, look, all these cards are different, there's nothing wrong with them, right? By saying that, you're implying that they could be something that's wrong with the cards. And if people's frame of mind's not already that way out, then you're bringing up a red flag that didn't exist before. So try to keep those implications to a minimum. And another thing that I want to point out is that you're shuffling the cards. If I'm right, this is Louis Laval's routine, and it utilizes a principle called the Gilbreth Principle. And Mick Clark has a brilliant version of the Gilbreth Principle that he uses in a routine called Memory Shuffle version two. And I really love that. But one thing that I always said to Mick when he were performing that is, put a distance between you and your deck. And now you can ask your audience, is there anybody here that plays poker? Somebody says, yes. Can you do that poker shuffle that all good poker players seem to be able to do? And if they say yes now, brilliant. You can allow your spectator to riffle shuffle a deck. But notice I didn't say, can you riffle shuffle a deck? I said, could you do that poker shuffle that all good poker players seem to be able to do? That implies that you're not very good with cards, which is exactly what you want for this type of routine. So they then shuffle the cards and they can be cut, shuffled again and cut and you utilize the Gilbreth principle. And there's a distance between you and your prop. So whenever I'm performing, I try to make it seem like I'm not near the prop or the thing that I'm using because distance is always a brilliant thing in performance. And I don't know if I mentioned this in another video, but I'm going to mention it again just in case I didn't. When Uri Geller were doing a drawing duplication from, say, two feet away, he'd imply that this is a much bigger thing because he'd say, oh, you know, I was once working with the CIA and I were in California and they had me try to do this all the way over in Florida and it took such a long time. And I don't know if the results are going to be good now, but we're going to try this. And by doing it two feet away, it then confirms the story of him doing it from California to Florida or wherever. And that's the same here. Try to keep your implications positive as opposed to negative. You know, don't mention that all the cards are different. Don't mention that this is all above board. Don't mention nothing weird's going on because it implies that it there could be something weird going on. It's a lot of white space here, like a white cross. So this is why you use one style of cards when you've practiced your scripting. You said there's a lot of white space here. There's not, it's a black card. And that's what I was saying earlier on, using a black card when you usually use white cards is A, different and difficult for your audience, but also when you've practiced a certain way, it becomes difficult for you. So is that the four, four hearts? Yeah? Right, so that, that's the first part. So one card, can I just take that? One yeah. card's okay. Right, so we'll put that there. Okay. So what I want you to do is to pick up the rest of these. Right, hold them in your hands. Okay. Don't be so precious with your props. And I, I understand the reason that you're being precious, and I understand the reason that you're being careful, but don't be as careful with your props. You've got to be relaxed and carefree. You've got to say to them, pick them up. And if they drop some, they drop some, but say to them, be careful not to drop any. You know, pick them up, be careful not to drop any. These were well mixed. You saw them being mixed up a second ago. And it just, you know, you don't need to hand them it like it's a baby being cushioned. The more carefree that you are, the more carefree the entire performance feels and the more impossible it feels because it's relaxed. This has got even more white space, so I'm guessing this is two for a heart. Okay, no, now carry on to the next heart card. Um. 
at this point what I'd suggest that you do is I'd suggest that you have them either take the card out and put it face up on the table because then everything resets itself and I hope you understand what I mean by that you can have them dealing them face up and whenever they hit the cards that are hearts you have them separate them and put them face up in a pile on the table and that way now the deck stays in the same order because they're dealing them face up and you're also resetting your uh, I'll censor that little bit out. So the rest of this is a memory demonstration which I'm not going to play through to the end. The link will be in the description. So now we're back from overviewing those performances. I just want to thank Sage Warden, Chris Thompson and Daniel Sutton for sending in those performance videos. And it takes a lot of guts to send in videos to have somebody pick apart. But as I've said multiple times, that's the only way that we learn is by looking at ourselves and having somebody with an analytical eye go through that performance and pick out the things that didn't really work or are not quite correct. And if you've got a piece of footage that you'd like me to review, remember there is a part two and a part three coming. Leave that performance link in the comment section of this video. And if you're not following me on Instagram, my handle is underscore Peter underscore Turner and that'll be on the screen somewhere. You can send me a private message on Instagram if you prefer. But anyway, with that said, I'd love to summarize. And the reason I'd love to summarize is because you can quickly come into this section of the video to pull information from to learn the tips and the tricks that I shared. So in Sage Warden's performance, it was a brilliant performance. Great pacing, great scripting, the premise was, was good. It's just the golden rule were broken. You turned your back on your audience. Make sure your props are in front of you. Make sure that anything that you're performing with is within arm's reach, at arm's length. Always keep a spare pack of billets in your pocket or a packet of cards just in case something goes wrong so you can quickly deviate and move into a different routine. If you're using pens, keep multiple pens in your pockets so that what you can do is quickly dip into any pocket and out will come a pen because the worst thing in the world is seeing a really slick mentalist fall to pieces because they can't find a pen. So you can't plan for stuff like this. If you forget somebody's name, and this happens a lot, and I, you know, during watching the performance video, I didn't hear the spectator's name just because of the audio. But then when I played it back, I heard the spectator's name. And this is why it's inspired me to bring this up, I suppose. But if you forget the spectator's name, there's a couple of tricks that you can do to get it back. And one of those tricks is this. If you're performing mentalism, I talk about ancestry.com and how our lineage, our heritage, our names are based off of what jobs we did in the past. And it tells us about us as a person. For example, if your last name is Smith, you might have been a locksmith or a blacksmith. And it's the sort of person that's durable, that's tough, that's outgoing. And you give a little bit of a reading there, nothing too you know, incredulous, but you just give a basis for a small reading. And then you say, what's your full name? And now they'll repeat their first name again, then probably a middle name and a last name. And then you just give some reading that you've made up or that you've got stored as a stock reading. But now you've got the person's first name again, which is really, really important. If you don't have time to do that and you want to keep your performances concise, you could get another participant involved and say, introduce yourselves, please shake hands. You know, say I'm, and, and now you could get them to introduce themselves to each other and quickly give each other's names, which is a, a nice little way to get it back. And so you hear it without having to re-ask. Because again, there's nothing worse than a mentalist that's asking somebody for a name if they've forgotten it. And I know you didn't do that, Sage, I just thought I'd add it. Learn ways to convey and translate what it is that you're saying to your audience. We talked about the block of wood and the staple and reducing this big moment right down to the size of a staple. Now I call that a point of reference. And if you're ever performing propless mentalism, the main problem with revealing something verbally, and I know you weren't revealing anything verbally, but it really ties into this point. If you're revealing something verbally and this person in the chair goes, yeah, that, that's what I was thinking of, then that's the only basis the entire audience have, the foundation they have to react from. So if they're going, yeah, yeah, that's great. Everybody else's elation is like this. Whereas if they've, they're thinking of something and you've wrote it down and you say, for the first time, tell everybody nice and clearly what you were thinking of. And they say a hammer and then you turn it round, boom. And you bring the revelation round in a circle. Everybody here has a chance to react at an elated level. And therefore it isn't based on this person's reaction. And so point of reference is important. So when you're conveying at the biggest moment in your performance, try to find a way to make it big. And so 
even though it's a block of wood and it seems solid, and we are talking about the staple gun roulette here as you just jumped into this section, they're looking at a staple this big and they're ba the audience are basing their entire reaction from this person's reaction. So try to convey that gravitas in a different way. And anything that you're trying to convey, think about the outward appearance from the audience's perspective and the reaction will be much bigger. Allow your audience to react, tell them it's okay, allow them to be louder and louder and louder and louder. And that's a big, big thing when you're performing. It's a really, really big thing. So Sage, thank you for sending in your piece of footage. And like I say, you didn't really do that much wrong. It's just slight refinements that you need to make. So on to Chris Thompson. Chris, if you're watching this, I consider you one of my friends, you know that, you're part of my social circle. And the only thing that I really got to say to you is, your video is a perfect display of why people need to practice and why sometimes magic and mentalism gets such a bad name. And people like my gran hate, my nan, she hates magic and mentalism. And the reason she hates magic and mentalism is because one experience she had when she was younger and it was somebody who gives such a bad performance that it tainted her opinion of it for the rest of her time on this planet. And you're the person that's doing that. You're the person that's going out and giving those performances. I'm not saying that you're giving bad performances all the time. What I'm saying is you've got to remember that. And please stop being lazy. Review your footage before you put it on YouTube. Because my critique of it were fairly... But somebody else's is not going to be as level as that. It's going to be, you know, they're going to pull it to pieces and they're going to say some really nasty stuff. And it's the public that are reviewing these videos if they want to book you for a show. Listen to what the audience is saying. I used to, years ago, put a recorder in the audience or have a friend of mine sat there with audio recordings and asking people, you know, what do you think of the show? So that if there's any moments in performance that weren't right, I could fix because who knows better than your audience? And it's easy to say, oh, well, these are not qualified to make decisions about magic. Well, you don't have to be a chef to taste the soup. The audience are the only people that count. So by listening to what it is they've got to say on an audio recording, let's say, for example, there's a routine where the method doesn't involve you going to your pocket, but you go to your pocket and then you hear someone in the audience go, he's just gone to his pocket, there must be something there. Then take that moment out of the performance. You know how to fix it. Listen to what your friends are saying to you. When there's three or four of us that are saying things to you about practice and about rehearsing and about scripting and about taking your time, don't stand there and go, oh, I haven't had time. You know, it just doesn't work. It does not work. Take your time, rehearse, and listen to what people are saying and actively, actively go out there and apply the information that you're getting given. So... To take away from Chris's video, listen to your audience, think about what it is that you're doing, learn how to transition between one prop and another, do not take the mic out of the mic stand if you don't have proper mic technique. Either learn to hold a mic under your arm, have a top pocket so it sits in your top pocket, don't use a handheld microphone, use a headset. I'd always recommend a headset or a lavalier or, lavalier or one of these microphones, you know, a lapel. Don't use a handheld if you're not adept. Move the participant into your performance space or get the mic stand and move it to them. Don't take the microphone out the cradle when you need your hands for the performance. It's the cardinal sin. Moving into Daniel's performance. Daniel, again, the premise and the plot were great. It fell apart, though, the moment that you used those black playing cards and you practiced with white playing cards because you said, oh, I'm seeing a lot of white space. Well, if you were seeing through that person's eyes, then the card would be black. So you shut on your own narrative, right? And it's not very much to pick apart, but like I said, these videos, it's only refinements that need making to make them incredible. Think about it. Take your time. Think about what prop you're using. Think about the moment that you get your information. It's got to be a clean moment. It's got to be a motivated moment. I taught you a motivation for that. Go back and play it back. Think about when you bring in, this is the big rule, it's same with a billet peak, for example. With a billet peak, and if you don't know what a billet is, and you don't know what a billet peak is, then go study some foundational mentalism. And if you've stumbled upon this channel and you're not a performer or a mentalist, this won't make any sense to you. You've got to learn to bring the peak into your own eyeline. You can't just expect, you know, a moment to occur where you do this or you're doing this. If I'm doing a billet peak, I'll say some, something along the lines of, you know, you've got a piece of information inside your head. 
So all I want you to do is stare right at me and just send that piece of information into my head. Well, in that moment there, send it into my head, this is in my eye line. So, you know, you've got a piece of information inside your head. So just look right at me and just send that information from your head into mine. And I'm done. I found a motivation for looking at the right time. I found a piece of choreography that naturally fits. I could even just be looking at it pretending to write, no, I'm going to change my mind on that. And it's the same as this. Find motivations for the horrible moments, especially when you're being filmed. You don't know who's filming you these days. Everybody has access to a HD camera at their fingertips. And that's a worrying thought because anybody can record your performance, anybody can record what you're saying, anybody can capture what it is that you're doing and play it back time and time and time again. And I'd highly recommend checking out Mick Clark's Memory Shuffle version 2 because that'll allow you to do a, a kicker to the ending of this routine that I think is brilliant and I really love. And if you can get that, it's worth getting. So with that said, that's the end of this video. I know it's a long, long, long video. There is a part two and a part three. If you're not subscribed to this channel, click the subscribe button so that you can keep up to date with my antics. You can keep up to date with my adventures and different videos that I upload. And we will be doing giveaways in the future. So from me to you, thank you for checking this video out. Take care.